The History of Castle Bar podcast is sponsored by mayobooks.ie. Hello and welcome to the History of Castle Bar podcast. I'm Noel Campbell. And I'm John Healy. Each week we'll be discussing a selected chapter from our book, The History of Castle Bar, which is available online from mayobooks.ie or in store in the Castle Bookshop. This week we'll be looking at one of John's chapters from the book, Chapels and Churches. John, Chapels and Churches, quite an extensive topic to talk about. Could you tell us, to start, what do we know about the earliest Christian church in, in what became Castlebar? Well, I suppose, Noel, if we, if we turn the clock back, we know that the, the first Christian church was a monastic settlement and it was located on the slight hill overlooking Loch Lena. It's what we call now the old graveyard, the, the mound over the, over the lake. And of course, we must remember that at that time, the town as we know it now didn't exist. The community settlement at Loch Lana was the origins of the town. And it would be another 800 years before Barry would construct his castle down by down by the river and several more centuries until the streets and the roads and the town dwellings began to, to take shape. So the first church, it would have been of wooden construction and later replaced by a stone building. Now, traces of that have been found particularly by Brona Gallagher in her own survey done some years ago. Now, I'd also add that up up until very recent times, the lake was known locally as Church Lake. Even in my own time, it was always referred to as Church Lake. And the graveyard was referred to as the old churchyard, which would kind of confirm that, in other words, the oral history confirms the belief that that was where the first Christian church or post-Patrician church was was located. Now, with the Reformation and the suppression of the Catholic faith, that church was taken over by the Protestant faith. The church in the graveyard was taken over in 1603 or thereabouts, and it continued in use until 1739 when Christ Church was opened. It continued in use, I should say, as a Protestant church. The old church then was dismantled in 1739, and the local belief is that the stone was taken away and used in the buildings in Lawn House for Lord Lucan. So for over a hundred years, there was no Catholic church or indeed no Catholic clergy in Castlebar. But with the easing of the penal laws in 1800, that began to change. Father Dennis Egan became PP, the first PP for a century in around 1797 or 1798. And he set about building what would become known as the Barn Church. I think officially it was Our Lady's Church, but it was always known as the Barn Church. And this was located between the present church and the monastery, where the car park is now of the of the main church. And that's where the Barn Church was. It was a fairly basic building, stone flooring, no seating except along each wall. The congregation stood or knelt in the middle of the of the, the floor, women on one side, men on the other. Uh, there was an organ gallery and loft, all right, but that was it. The Earl of Lucan donated the first organ for the church and was present at the dedication. Now, Father McGee became PP in 1871, and his first objective was to replace the Barn Church. Now, the Barn Church, as you can imagine, it was built fairly quickly. It was in a fairly decrepit state after 70 years. And this idea of building a new, proper, modern church was fully backed by every section of the of the community. And donations flowed in and £2,000, which was a lot of money then, was collected in a very, very short space of time. One of the biggest benefactors was a man called Michael Quinn. Now, Michael Quinn was a wealthy landowner and he also donated the site for the church. Now, this church was to be built across the road from the present church, where the parochial house now stands, the parish priest's house. So work got underway. A certain amount of money was raised. Work got underway. They thought that in order to reduce the cost, they wouldn't appoint a main contractor. So it was all done by subcontractor with a clerk of works in charge. Proved not to be such a great idea in the end because progress was very slow. But when the building reached roof height, funds ran out and work had to stop. Money was scarce at that stage. There was signs of another 
famine again, you know, there was a pandemic, there was disease, people were, people just didn't have the money to to contribute to the continuation of the church. So the church was abandoned, literally. It was left there for, I suppose, 20 years, exposed to the elements, nothing happening, no money, and not a lot of, of push to get anything anything done, you know. And today, of so course, we have the fine Church of the Holy Rosary. Right. Uh, how yeah. did that come about? I mean, that, that was a, quite a, a, an architectural feat for the size was, of Castle Bar. It was a big... Not easily achieved, I'd say. And not easily achieved and subject to a lot of controversy as well at the time, you know. Father McGee had been the PP who had started the abandoned church. At the time, it was called the McHale Church because... Dr. McHale, the Archbishop of Tume, after whom McHale Park is named, turned the stone on the abandoned church, as I call it now. But Father Lyon succeeded Father McGee in, as PP in Castlebar. And in Tume, Dr. McEvely succeeded McHale as the Archbishop of Tume. There had been a long history of ill feeling between the two of them. People felt that McEvely resented the fact that this was being called the McHale Church and it was felt that he didn't want to give McHale any credit for any church in Castlebar. So the result was that he eased up on the, the building of the church, didn't press Lyons to continue for a few years. So eventually Father Lyons decided and made an announcement that on architectural advice, the old church was no longer fit and that it would have to be completely dismantled and a new church would be built on the other side where it is now down close to the river. Of course this caused uproar in the town. People had donated, first of all people had donated money for what they thought, thought was to be the McHale church and the second thing was that Michael Quinn who was the main benefactor and the main landowner in the town felt aggrieved that his friend Archbishop McHale was going to be written out of history so it led to a lot of acrimony. There was heated meetings. There was arguments in the street. Public meetings were held. Police were drafted in at weekends to keep the peace. The local papers took two sides. The Connacht Telegraph sided with Cannon Lyons. The Western People sided with Michael Quinn. And this went on for several years until eventually Lyons said, look, that's it. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to build this church, the new church, and that's it. So he did. He went away. The old church was dismantled stone by stone. The stones were brought across the road and incorporated into the new church, except for one stone, which remains to this day. If you look at the corner of the lawn of the priest's house, you'll see a circular column, which was the last remaining piece of the old abandoned church. That sounds so it was an extraordinary story. A, a, to get it to roof height and all that effort. And then, to, yeah. and then out of... Competition, essentially. Yeah. It was to go down. That's really again. what it was put down to in the end, that it was bitterness between the two prelates. And actually, the, the, the church itself is in, it was meant to have a steeple on it, was it? Or? That's right, it was, yeah. yes. And that never, never, came, never about. came out either, yeah. I suppose yeah. it's very hard to go around to the houses again asking for money after, well, the, after the debacle <laughs> they had seen <laughs> with the two. Well, an interesting thing about it was that um, while this dispute was going on, uh, but in Tubber Abbey was being re-roofed and Sir John Power had given money for that. He was the benefactor for Bell and Tubber Abbey. And McKevley stepped in and he ordered that the funds from Bell and Tubber be diverted to Castlebar. at which stage Power said, I won't give money to anybody. So they both, they both lost, both Bell and Tubber and Castlebar lost out. The money was never paid up, yeah. My yeah. goodness. Yeah. Of course, the two big religions in the town were, well, I suppose it was the Catholic Church, and then you had your Church of and Ireland Church as well, which was, yes, you had mentioned some of the origins of the old Church of Ireland building up there. That's true, yeah, yeah. It's it's the oldest public building in the town, as you know. So it was opened, it was opened for worship in 1739. In fact, the, the plaque to that is still on the wall inside the main gate. And it replaced that church of, at Loch Lana, which had been there since, since 1603. Up to 1804, Protestant burials took place in the grounds of Christ Church. But then Lord Lucan decided he'd donate a, a new Protestant graveyard, which is the one on the town side of the Traverse Right. It's still there. Yeah. It's still the Protestant graveyard, yeah. you know. 
But the remaining plots in the around the Christchurch were sold off to the gentry. So they could be buried inside the walls of Christchurch, whereas the, mm. the rank and file had to go up. But the money was used, the money raised was used to repair the church, which had been badly damaged in 1798, of course mm. it was. And I think it was damaged in a storm some years afterwards. So the money was well spent. Or mm. it, was a, it was a wise move to, to do that, you know. Yeah, and that's probably a little known fact that that is the Protestant graveyard and people are still actually being... Been buried. Been buried. That is correct. Yeah. 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 There was and a recent uh, last year. I think was the most recent burial there. If anyone got the that. opportunity to go into Christchurch as well, very interesting inside all the very plaques and the history of the Bing- Binghams and uh, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. Of course, there was there was you know other other religions in the town, John. Like there were in most towns, you know, there was Presbyterians. Well, you had the Methodists Presby- as well. What do we know of of those two? Yeah. Well, the Presbyterians. Yeah, there was quite a bit, quite a, a large Presbyterian presence in the town. They would have come towards the end of the 1790s or maybe 1800s. A number of Ulster families came to Turla, to the estate of, of Colonel Fitzgerald. Some of them actually had been United of the United Irishmen persuasion, strangely enough. And maybe that's why they came down south. I, I don't know. Mm. But they settled in Turla. There were Presbyterians and Episcopalians of both sect. So they wanted a minister for their own religion and they asked Fitzgerald would he fund a minister for the religion. Mm. He said he'd fund one but not two and he said he'd take a vote. So whichever was the strongest in the ballot box <laughs> would be the... So the, the the Presbyterians had bigger numbers so he appointed a Presbyterian minister and he ministered in turn of for... It was originally Turla Parish. They didn't come into Castlebar much, you see. They were based they were based in Turla, in which there were, I think, maybe forty families in by eighteen twenty five, I think there were forty families in the church in the Presbyterian Church in Turla. It's quite a lot. Quite a big number. <laughs> quite a big number. They were anxious to get into Castlebar, so eventually the rector of their church, a Reverend Andrew Brown, conducted a service in the courthouse. I think that first service was held in 1854 and he did that every week for nearly 10 years. They were still looking for a premises in Castlebar. So a Dr Christie who owned property down at Lord Charles Street offered his place to the church and they bought it and the foundation stone of a Presbyterian church was laid by a man called Henry Todd now, there was a very big company in Dublin called Todd Burns and Company. They were a retail shop. And this Henry Todd was one of the principals. He turned the sod on it. They built the church. It was called the Kirk. Uh, it had a, a manse on one side and a, around the corner in Richard Street, they had a small school. And that lasted. It was at its height while the Scottish regiments were stationed here, you see, because they would come to the Kirk mm. every Sunday for service. It was always a big occasion, you know, parading through the town and that sort of thing. When they left, the sort of the numbers fell off and eventually they decided they'd sell off the property. So a uh, Mr. Ryan bought it in 1923. He bought the whole lot, the church and the manse and the, the school. And he lived there with his family until the 1940s. And he sold it again. It was divided up then to, into private residences and sold but the Kirk became Kirk became a lot of things. It was a dancing school. It was a boxing club. Yes. It was an auction room for furniture. Yeah. Brian Morden's father ran auctions there. It was a, a, a workshop for Paddy MacDonald, the building contractor, yeah, Sean yeah. MacDonald's father. And eventually it became an art gallery owned by Paddy McGuinness. And now it's the Tulsi That's restaurant. Right. So it has gone the full, the full gamut from a house of worship to an Indian restaurant yeah. with a lot of... A lot of stages in between, you know. I remember the excitement when the McDonald one opened up. People thought it was, uh, kids of our age thought this was McDonald's coming to town. Yes. A different McDonald's. <laughs> a different McDonald's completely, exactly. And and, exactly. and and the John Wesley connection with Castlebar, he's a strong connection, of course. The That's man right, visited a strong the town connection. It. Yeah, yeah. Um, Wesley visited Ireland, you know, many, many times. Uh, and he was particularly friendly with the Brown family in Rehens. He used to stay with the Browns when he'd visit Ireland. And in 1785, he 
turn, he laid the foundation stone for the Methodist Church on on the Mall. And it said that it was the only he had been in, in in Ireland twenty or twenty one times, which was the only time, it's the only church that he had laid the foundation stone. Funny enough, I don't know what what coincidence that was, but uh, yeah, it was it was a, a fine church, and unusually it had a manse residence beside it, mm-hmm. plus a walled garden. I think you, you might see the walled. Mm where our footballs used to yeah, win when we played yeah. on the man and we weren't able to retrieve them. And it was, they had very good relations with the Church of Ireland because the minister, Wesley was invited up by Ellison to preach in the Church of Ireland. And the Methodist Church was made available to the Church of Ireland community when repairs were being carried out in, in the church. But just a couple of things about it. One was that they were always harassed by young boys playing football and hurling while service was on, mm. uh, with the result that they had to petition the Urban Council several times to bring in a law to prevent this ball play in Jordan Divine service. And the second thing was that there was a court case where two young fellas were prosecuted for playing pitch and toss, just, you know, on the steps as you go up from Rock Square. Yes, yeah. They were playing pitch and toss while Divine service was being held inside <laughs> <laughs> they were severely censured and <laughs> given the Probation Act and told not to play any more pitch and toss while the... Oh, what kind of a racket could have been created with a few coins or whatever they were playing Well, with? I suppose there might have been a lot of yahoo and, <laughs> and, and cheering <laughs> when the two heads had come up or whatever it would be. But eventually in 1985, I think, no, earlier than that, I think maybe nine, the Reverend Crawford was the last one Sorry, Reverend Farley was the last one. And he left in 1958. I just vaguely remember him myself. He was uh, um, he was appointed to Westport and Castle Bar. And he left. And the building was, first of all, it was leased to the, v- the VEC, I think. It became a tourist office, an art centre. It was let to the Mayo County Council. And, of course, now it has been, it's in use again as a, Church of Worship, the Church of Christian Fellowship are back in there again. But in 1985, there was a ceremony, a small celebration. Mary Farrell was the curator there at the time. And it was a small celebration just to mark the bicentenary of the of the building. And Frank O'Reilly, the, my neighbour on the Newport Road, constructed a model of the town of Castle Bar in 1785, which was put on display I don't know where that is now, but it would be interesting to know. But uh, to great acclaim, it was a big, big occasion, big occasion. But yeah, that was the story of the... If anyone knows where that model is, it'd be nice to get her... Wouldn't it? It'd be nice to get her hands on it. Wouldn't it? Yeah. 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 And, and of course, that the Methodist church there would have been the centre of all of that. Of all of it, yes. Around yeah. the barracks and the courthouse, yeah. etc. That's true. That's you know, true. Quite a busy part of town, yeah. as it is today. Yeah. Just to go back to Christchurch again... I don't think any of the, th- none of the Lucans are buried in Castle Bar, but their predecessors, the Binghams, mm. are. And there's a memorial tablet to Sir Henry Bingham. It's already, it's in the, the Christ Church. He died in 1714. And the inscription reads, in a vault near this place lieth Sir Henry Bingham. Now, where this, near this place, not, well, of course, the church wasn't yeah. there when the tablet was made, but... Where is the nearest place? Was it up in the military barracks or out in the grounds? Was it up in the great old graveyard? Yeah, yeah. That's something I suppose for. It'd be interesting to get for in another and, day. Uh, yeah, start rubbing chalk on tombstones and seeing just to seeing see what names come up there. Yeah. Well, he's yeah. obviously in the vicinity. He's given us the first clue, so it's a matter of going out and going out and getting <laughs> yeah. them. But it is yeah. very interesting, and there was a great. Great photo, I think. I think it's in the wind collection of, a, it must have been a service just starting where obviously the Bingham's got the front seats and it shows some of the, those attending the service in Christchurch just looking back to the door. Really? I think it was wind that really? took that picture. Right, right, and you yeah. can see them all starting in very small numbers, of course. So it must have been the kind of the dying ages of the ascendancy. Yeah. And uh, Well, even to this day, the, 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 the top pew in the church has a place saying Earl of Lucan. That was his. Even today, you know. Do we know, is there anything left of, you know, the churches are usually reused, especially some of the more uh, more cherished possessions of a church? Was anything, ex- does anything exist from the Barrenchurst? 
Baron Church did move into the Church of the Holy Rosary, crucifixes or anything. All of the material and the, the, the sacred instruments from the church were moved over. It would make sense. Yeah, yeah. were moved eventually into the into the new church. The Baron Church continued actually while the while the abandoned church remained abandoned. The Baron Church was still in use until the new church, church was, was ready, opened. which happened in 19, 1901. Thanks, John. That's a very interesting insight into the several denominations that operated here in Castlebar. Before we go to an ad break, we're going to take a look at an ad from the past. John, you found an interesting one for us. Well, this one all comes from March of 1956, and it was it's an ad in the Connacht Telegraph issued by the Department of Posts and Telegraphs. It's headed Unlicensed Wireless Sets, warning in big black type. In view of the evasion which is believed to be taking place still in the payment of wireless licence fees, it has been decided to conduct an intensive nationwide campaign against holders of unlicensed wireless sets beginning on Monday next, the 5th of March, 1956. Holders of unlicensed sets are urged in their own interests to take out licenses immediately as it is intended to prosecute every offender discovered during this campaign. A licence may be obtained at any post office at a cost of 17 shillings and sixpence, issued by the Department of Posts and Telegraphs. So in this age of mobile phones and ready-made radios, this is a, a really a blast from the past. Absolutely. Said. I do know because I knew some of the people who were involved, some of the post office officials whose job it was to go around and look at <laughs> look for licences that they'd let the word be known beforehand that we'll be around on Monday down this road and Tuesday. So it was a warning to the... It's something similar to you'd see nowadays with the uh, TV licence. Much little, the same thing. A little ad on the... To say we're coming. Yeah, that they were coming coming around, yeah. I, I've yet to see anyone who, who has the knock on the door, but anyways, <laughs> the, the fear is instilled in people. I had, a, there was a relation of mine was worked in the post office, his job was to go around, but there was a man prosecuted for not having a licence, but my friend went in and gave evidence that, in fact, he was only tampering what appeared to be a Phillips radio that didn't appear to be working well, uh, at which case your man got off with the, a severe warning from the bench, but I presume that he took out a radio, a radio license immediately after that. But that's an interesting, an interesting sign of the times. The Connor Telegraph, serving the community since 1828 and now reaching 1.5 million people per month on our online and print platforms. Since opening our doors in 2017, Bridge Street has evolved into a community hub a bar, meeting place and event space for locals and visitors to Castlebar. With weekly music sessions and performances of all genres, including a monthly Bridge of Song showcase of up-and-coming singer-songwriters, Bridge Street Castlebar keeps her lit. We'd like to invite listeners to submit any comments or questions or suggestions for discussion on the podcast. You can contact us at historyofcastlebar at gmail.com. And of course, we'd welcome all input from our listeners. We have a query in from a John Fahey, and it's quite a broad one and quite interesting. Now that uh, an Earl of Lucan is back in place, John, will we ever see a return of the Earl? A return to Castlebar? Absolutely. Um, I think the present Earl lives in Australia. Would I be right on that? I think I read that somewhere, that the present holder of the title is at the moment in Australia. But I think that he did visit Castlebar not so long ago. I don't know what pub he came to, but I, d- I didn't come across him. <laughs> but I'm told on good authority that he did visit the town with a couple of friends. I don't know did he make his identity all that well known. But yeah, I'd imagine that given the right circumstances, maybe if there's a book on Lord Lucan in the offing, he might just come back for a, for the launch of that. What would you think? He might come back for that or he might come back for ground rates. Of course, hasn't he? The ground rent's still here in town. Still to there, collected. yeah. And they're still being collected. The, so the, I believe. The current one is yeah. the, the the eighth Earl of Lucan, who's George Bingham, uh, a relatively young man who had a hard time uh, convincing the, the the courts over there that his, his father that was... his father was dead. ...was dead. Okay. Even though no yeah. body, of course, has been retrieved. And he is finally, uh, is finally entitled to call himself the eighth Earl um, I don't know what I don't I think he's only in his 50s he's quite a, a young man so um, as far as I know the, the rents are still being collected probably a very 
small fee. Very small, yes, uh, I think so. But they're yeah. still there. Will we see him come back to town? I'm not sure. What kind of a reception would he get? <laughs> Just going to ask you that question. Would it be a welcome for him? In all, this, he, in all this Will and Kate frenzy, could we make them a... Uh, are we going to make That's true. Uh, yeah, <laughs> George yeah. and his wife. The, Maybe there the would be a welcome ones. for him. Well, the, I suppose the, their history was so varied. You know, you had, you know, a very oppressive Lord Lucan, and then you had a very benign Lord yeah. Lucan. So that's very true. Yeah, you know, he, the, the fourth Earl did a lot to make up for the made the third Earl. Oh, absolutely, uh, harshness yeah. and bad he treatment. Was most of, generous to, to most generous to the town. So yeah, yeah, we'd look forward to seeing him, Noel. We'll see. On behalf of myself and John, I'd like to thank the listeners again for tuning into our podcast. And just a gentle reminder that, of course, our book can be bought online at mayobooks.ie or in store in the Castle Bookshop. John and I will be back again for our next episode, which will deal with Days of Revolution, 1914 to 1921 in Castlebar. And we look forward to your listenership then. The History of Castlebar podcast is sponsored by mayobooks.ie. The series is produced by me, Brendan Gilmartin. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend and leave a review.